in in this meeting here, um, we're gonna we're gonna leave the biblical text to the side, and I want to do another post on Gerard. Um, yeah, I I did one on uh, mimetic rivalry, which is what he's very famous for. But the other thing that he's famous for, in fact, uh, one of his great books, it it it, it may be uh, my favorite of his books, is called uh, Violence in the Sacred where he starts to lay out his theory of the scapegoat. And the scapegoat, of course, is an image taken from Leviticus. You have the two goats, one that is sent out into the wilderness. Everyone lays their hands on it. That is to say, they place their sins on this thing, and it's sent away from them. And then they have a second goat that they that they offer up. That's, that's not the, the scapegoat, but the, the, the animal that they offer up to sacrifice. All right. And those two things are pretty important to Girard, scapegoat and sacrifice itself. I don't think I'll have time today, I'll get into it eventually, to kind of tease those out. But I at least want to talk about, in the most skeletal, basic way, what the scapegoat mechanism is. Um, it, it will be pretty obvious to all of us. It's a phrase that we all know now. Oh, that's our scapegoat. All that means is, oh, that's our excuse. We need to lay blame on somebody Let's just blame that person. Great. Um, what Girard argues is that this is one of the founding and fundamental principles of human culture, is this scapegoating mechanism. It's how we all come together as a community. That's pretty frightening, actually. It's how we all come together as a community. We actually find unity in figuring out who's really to blame. And if we can all figure that out, we can and expel or kill that individual or group of people, then the problem will be solved and we all feel better. That's essentially what it boils down to. All right. So let me kind of tease this out a little bit for that. that I mean, that's it, basically. When we talk about scapegoats, that, that's what we're looking for. Sometimes what we mean by a scapegoat is we mean it's a lie. That person wasn't really guilty for what it is that we've said. We're just looking for an excuse. That's true, and that could be one form of the scapegoat, but that's not necessarily so. So let me just kind of tease out for you uh, the environment in which scapegoating uh, happens, and I'll, I'll maybe refer to some mythological texts, but a lot of times it may be um, um, kind of contemporary culture because we see it all the time. All right, so this is what it looks like. <clears throat> There's some problem in a community it doesn't matter. It could be a plague. Uh, um, it could be a uh, crime. Uh, it, it could just be general upheaval. And we don't know why it's happening, but we want to find out why it's happening so that we can help ourselves so that it's not happening any longer. Let me just give you a literary example. I think this is an example everybody knows, I think. Oedipus Rex. I'm, I'm hoping everyone knows the story. If you recall the beginning of Oedipus Rex, the people come to him and what's happening in Thebes, it's, it's being uh, destroyed by a plague. And we know why there's a plague they send for uh, Tiresias. And we're told, well, the reason why there's a plague is that the king was murdered. And what we have to do is find the murder of the king and expel that person then, then the plague will go away. You see how it's all set up for us here, right? Oedipus is a scapegoat. In Greek, the word is pharmakon. It's where we get the word pharmacy. Pharmakon means something both, he's the poison and the cure. Uh, the closest thing we have to this is something like anti-venom. Uh, if you get bitten by a rattlesnake, the way in which you cure that rattlesnake bite is through the venom of that rattlesnake. So rattlesnake bite is the poison, but what's the cure for it? Uh, that same poison, that same, sorry, that same venom, not poison, venom. All right. So what Girard detects in a lot of these ancient texts, and certainly biblical texts as well, is the way in which this mechanism plays out. So you have an upheaval in a community, whatever it may be, and there can be all sorts of accusations going around. You get this sort of mimetic, um, uh, you get this sort of acquisitive, we'll call it acquisitive mimesis, where each 
uh, we're each um, um, accusing one another of what we're uh, of who's guilty, and we're all looking for the true and real guilty party as we're doing this. All right. Occasionally, someone or a group of someones will show up who are ever so slightly different. Maybe they were an outsider. Remember, oh, this will, this will be a nice little gloss. Remember, when the Sodomites were ready to scapegoat Lot, what was the first thing they said? Who are you? Aren't you just a sojourner? <laughs> Aren't you? Sure, you were at the gate. Sure, you were kind of in control of certain things. But aren't you an outsider here? Ah, you, you can see they've turned their eyes on him. It's the littlest, it's the tiniest differences. Oh, just take Oedipus Rex. Do you know what the word Oedipus means? It means swollen foot. It, it goes back to the, whenever he was left in the woods, they put a pin through his feet so that he couldn't move and he would just die of exposure in the wilderness. So you have to imagine when, when you know, in any staging of Oedipus Rex, the lead character comes limping out. It's the smallest distinction. So Oedipus, limping, and he's an outsider. The smallest difference. That's got to be the reason. All right. I hope you understand what I'm trying to get at here. So previously, whenever I said mimetic rivalry is predicated upon sameness, that's where violence comes from. It's all, it's all the same here, except when that, it's all, the community's ready to go at itself just to hate each other. Someone's guilty for all of our ills. And now we can, that's acquisitive mimesis. I mean, this is ready for a war of all against all, bubbling over. It's just, we're going to destroy each other. And then look at the outsider. Look at the hunchback. It doesn't matter. Look at the albino. And I'm just going through lists of what you find in literature. All these just small differences, that must be the one. The acquisitive mimesis turns into a sort of conflictual mimesis, but we all have to agree that that really is the guilty party. All right. So, uh, so I'm a medievalist by training. This is what the Jews in the Middle Ages in Europe had to go through. We're all dying of the plague. Just think about, there's a plague for, and this is historical, mind you. Historical. This is not literary. This is historical. We're all dying of the plague. How are we dying of the plague? Ah, ah, it's the Jews who are poisoning the wells. So what do they do? They expel the Jews. Oh my goodness, they'll burn their houses. They'll kill them, but ultimately expel them. All right. And then guess what? Guess what happens? The community? Ah, we all feel better now. Do you think they'd stop dying of the plague? But guess what? They feel better. And we know this. We know this in the historical records. They think what they've done was right. In other words, all of that anger, all of that wrath where they're coming at each other because they're frightened, they're afraid. Here's death on their doorstep. But now they can turn it on to somebody, unleash that anger and that wrath onto a specific person or group of people. And then what is that? You've just blown off all that angst, all that steam, all that rage. You can't control the world. We've gone here, they're out, and now what? Oh, God, it feels so much better, doesn't it? Even if it doesn't solve the problem, that is the scapegoat mechanism. Here's what's something that's crucial. Is it for it to be effective? For it to be effective? Uh, we actually have to believe it. We actually have to believe it. We actually have to believe that person is guilty. If we can't believe it, if we think we're just going through some sort of, oh, I don't know, we're just going through the steps to go, eh, we kind of need to find someone to blame. You know, we're going to blame Danny. But if we don't buy it, it does not work. It has to be completely unconscious for that scapegoat mechanism to work. Now, you could be like Machiavelli, which please, for the love of God, do not be like Machiavelli. But one of his great insights was every once in a while, a prince has to just come up. If you have upheaval, just go find someone to blame and they'll turn on him, hang him, kill him. It doesn't matter. 
he knew how to use the scapegoat mechanism. It'll get the people off your back and turn to somebody else. So can you manipulate it? Absolutely. But I'm talking this kind of pure form of, it's going to sound terrible to you. I don't even know that I want to use the phrase, but I'm going to. A sort of innocent scapegoating. What I mean by innocent scapegoating is that you really don't know what it is that you're, you truly believe in what it is that you're doing. All of these problems. Look, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge NBA fan. Um, and uh, even worse, now a lot of you will probably unsubscribe, so forgive me for this, but I'm a Lakers fan. And every time there's a problem, I can tell you who the problem is. It is management. It's always management. Stupid genie bus. Palinka drives me nuts. He does it. I love him. I think he's fantastic. But in any sports, all of us know, all of us know, unless you're a real true believer, when we get rid of that head coach, that's not solving our problem. <laughs> it makes us feel better. We can go, oh, thank God. Now get us a new coach. And it turns out sometimes it works. That's the frightening thing about this. It is arbitrary, but my God, it's an effectual arbitrariness. That's the scapegoat mechanism. Now, I'm going to, I think I've explained it enough. I don't want to repeat myself. But now I'm going to go one step further in the few minutes that I have left here. Girard takes this to the gospel text. Here's his argument. Is that what the gospel texts reveal is the absolute arbitrariness of the scapegoat mechanism. Look at, look at the ways in which they're trying to put Christ up for a trial. Is he really guilty? Pontius Pilate, you know, he's like, I don't see anything that he's done. He sends him off, right? He sends him off to Herod. And Herod's like, I want nothing to do. And it actually tells us that Herod and Pontius Pilate became friends with one another after this. And then, of course, what do we see? We see him up on the cross. And do you remember the words of, of, of Christ whenever he's up there? It's, it's absolutely stunning, I think. He says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. In Girardian terms, what he's saying is they're participating in the scapegoat mechanism and they have no idea what they're doing. And then remember the one uh, in, in Matthew and Luke, we get we get two different responses from the soldier. One says, truly, this was uh, this was the son of God. The second one says, truly, this man was innocent. Oh, my God. Like, you can't do that with the scapegoat mechanism. Under no circumstances can you go back and tell the mob, hey, guess what? He was actually innocent. We were being completely arbitrary. If you do that, you've destroyed everything. And that's Gerard's ultimate argument as to what the gospel text does, is that it unmasks the scapegoat mechanism that, that all of culture builds itself around. That Christ unmasks the lie of this unanimous violence on one single person or group to just say this is how you bound yourself together through violence. And guess what? The scapegoat mechanism is only going to be temporary because guess what? You're going to have more problems. You think you're ever going to live in a community, in a culture that doesn't have its problems? You're lying to yourself. Girard's argument is we always need those. Well, he's not making this argument. He's pointing out we always need those scapegoats to kind of cohere. And he says in Christianity, and he was a devout Christian, a very faithful Catholic. And he says, what Christ does in the revelation of the scapegoat mechanism is he's rendered it uh, useless because now we all know the lie. I'm going to go one step further. Now, this will really bother you, but that's okay. We'll keep doing these Girard things and hopefully I can clean up whatever messes I make. We'll go one step further. I think all of modernity is predicated upon a victimage mechanism. It's why we have so many crises all the time and why we're always looking for our scapegoats, no matter who it is, what it is. I mean, in American politics, uh, that's our political rhetoric. All they try to do is sell you, if you're the party out of power, how bad things are. And then guess who the problem is? Oh, it's the president. That's it. That's as simple as it gets. We always try to build up the crisis that we have and then vote that person out. It's all participating in that scapegoat mechanism. Here's what Girard's arguing is that Christ has unmasked it. If he's unmasked it, and that's how we find peace in the human community, is all of us coming together to blame a certain group or a certain person so that we can feel better unconsciously and that Christ has made us actually conscious of this mechanism, well, then we're in a 
we're in a whole lot of trouble now because now where's our outlet? If we know the scapegoat mechanism is a lie, if we're always worried about creating victims, and we are, Nietzsche's rolling in his grave right now. We are the anti-Nietzschean <laughs> uh, uh, a generation because he saw in Christianity its preference for the victim and not the victimizers. He, this is what he sees as the weakness of Christianity, that, that we try to uh, defeat people through our own weakness and make them feel guilty and bad for being so very strong. Welcome to 2024. All we do is take the side of victims. We are far more Christian than I think we could ever imagine ourselves being because we're concerned with victims. The problem is now, what do we want to do? Oh, let's find the true victim. Do you understand what, what I've just tried to offer up to us here? We're concerned about the victim, but now we just look for the victimizer. Who's the one true victimizer? If we could just rid ourselves of that, we'd live in peace and harmony. In other words, we live in a scapegoat, scapegoating culture. We've just reversed it. We haven't done away with it. We've done away with it in as much as we're worried about creating victims, but we haven't done away with it in as much as we're looking for the ultimate victimizers to be able to say who's responsible for all this. If we can just get that group of people out of here, then we're good to go. Well, welcome to politics. This is that sort of Girardian um, um, insight that, that I find in it a lot of explanatory power in terms of literature, anthropology, psychology, and it turns out a lot of politics. In fact, one of his final books, uh, that the uh, American title is Battling to the End, um, he gets into a lot of the kind of the political meditations on this sort of thing. And I only bring this up not to be political. I won't be political on this channel. This is just to give you an example so that you can look around and go, oh, I see how this is working out. Oh, I see how this is working out. But the most important thing is that you have to believe it. If you don't believe it as a community, it doesn't work because then you all know that you're lying and that person wasn't really guilty. We have to believe that that scapegoat was actually guilty of everything that we're saying that they did. And here, let me go one step further. Let's pretend you have a serial killer in your community. There, that's a happy thought. And everybody's up in arms over the serial killer. And there are accusations left and right. Oh, you know, this, this guy who just came into town. Oh, it's the homeless people. Oh my gosh, we have all these new homeless people here. Blah, 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 blah. All right. Let's say they really do find the serial killer, like DNA evidence. We know he's the killer. All right. And we send him to prison. Even, even better. Even better. We'll, we'll do this. We put him to death. Right. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, good. We could, we feel all that release. Here's where the release comes from, though. It wasn't putting him to death. It was because we actually believe he was guilty for all of our emotions and the terror that we felt. But in fact, that was coming from us, not from him. Does he bring it to us? Yes. But it was that going at one another. That's where the relief actually is. All right. So next time, we'll get back to Genesis. We'll get back to the Jacob and Esau story. So until next time.